Connects, where our goal is to help you read through the Bible just by giving you a heads up on what's coming up this week in your scripture reading in the Old, New, Old and New Testament and the wisdom literature. And, uh, and so we uh, want to do that today, and we are in week number 35 as we're closing Ooh, out the on, year. Man. We're in the final quarter that of the year. Success. Yes, and pretty soon we're going to start challenging you to read ahead because in 2023, we want to do the same thing, but we want to read through the Bible in a chronological order. And uh, so we will try to put in your hands chronological Bible, a lot of that kind of stuff, but it'll be good and uh, to find the order and the historicity of it. So uh, pretty excited for that. And I think that as you read it the second time through, Leviticus will not be so hard to read. Uh, Deuteronomy will not be so hard to read. And you'll find that the Ecclesiastes does have a lot of positivity in it, no matter how you read it. Uh, it's a cliffhanger. It is a cliffhanger. I just don't so that, tell the end. Oh, yeah, get there. yeah, somebody snap your fingers at Clayton so we can keep going. So uh, the next, yesterday and then the following Sunday, this coming Sunday, we are doing a little short-lived series called What If? What If? And it's kind of based, loosely based off of a... Uh, card game that I saw years ago, and I don't necessarily advocate the card game, but it's just uh, what if questions, you know, if you, if you could, uh, um, based on a hypothetical situation, and so we're going to kind of play off of that just a little bit in Sunday service again, but I got a question for the guys, uh, what, uh, what if you could have any superhero power? Oh, got it, easy. What super peer... Super. <laughs> That's. I just had. <laughs> Clayton would be McDonald Man, is what Clayton <laughs> would be. Donald's. He would be the McDonald Man. Clayton. So what? What superpower would you have, Don? Obviously. Well, I was thinking. <laughs> there's just something innately interesting. Innately interesting. If that's a. If those can go together about. The ability to peer into the future. So if I could have, my superpower would be that uh, I don't remember the show, the daily. What was that? Or not the daily, but the you get the newspaper the day ahead. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah. So that's a, that feels like a superpower. It's not Marvel, but um, that feels like a superpower. And then um, that would just be cool. That'd be cool. You could help people. You could. You'd have to have the power to do something about it, or else you become a really negative person. If you, if you do something that was big, huge, terrible was coming, you couldn't stop it. That'd be pretty uh, terrible. But uh, but there's a lot of positive you could do with it. <laughs> I'm glad positivity's in the room. Yeah. Right now. <laughs> Henry, what about you? Okay, I'll invent my own superpower. I want the ability. Point to it. Oh, invent that. Let's, yeah, let's that's see. That's my superpower. superpower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's my superpower to invent my own superpower. Yes. It's kind of useful in general. Uh, I would like the ability to be able to stay up 22 hours a day and be fully rested. Why don't you just go over 24? You know, I don't want to push that. You still want that? You still want <laughs> like sleep. I know. You still that beautiful moment there is of falling asleep. There is an enjoyable part of really, You get that beautiful moment of falling asleep and waking up. I mean, just, yeah. just, just, two hours. Well, just go for 23 hours and, and, and 35 okay. minutes. Oh, <laughs> so I want the ability to stay awake 23 hours and 30 minutes like Pastor Diamond. <laughs> Says, who knows the future according to <laughs> Emery, it's your superpower. Just oh. do, do what you will. <laughs> so we now have a dangerous combination. Don knowing the future and Emery lack of sleep. <laughs> Half an hour. He knows what's going to happen. I'll be awake. Half an hour. He did, Emery will just oh, embrace man. it all. Wait, wait, oh, wait. oh, man. <laughs> Yeah. Layton, what would be What's yours? Teleportation. Ooh, teleportation. Oh, that's a good one. Kind of like Doctor Strange with the. Uh, just, just simply to not drive hours anywhere and just be yeah. there. <laughs> step, <laughs> step through the circle. Yeah. Oh, that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. All right. Well, guys. Well, hold it All right. Yeah. Okay. Come on. What's you? yours? Come on, superpower. Come <laughs> 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 on. <laughs> you know. <laughs> My superpower would be to try to control you for yeah. <laughs> and move in a positive yeah, direction. We can yeah. dream. Yeah, we can dream. That's right. Ain't gonna happen, baby. Ain't gonna happen. Oh, All right, well, listen, let's jump in. Yeah. Old oh, Testament. Man. Here we go, Emery. 
Okay, so hey, as you guys have been reading this week, you'll see that we, we come upon something that we've kind of had to adjust for. We talked about it a little bit last time. Uh, well, the truth is, in your book, in, in your one-year Bible, uh, Job is just listed as an Old Testament uh, book. But actually, it's a wisdom lit book. It's, most people classify it as a wisdom lit book. So today, I'm going to be sharing that with Clayton, who's going to do all wisdom lit including that. But what I wanted to do, I wanted to bring a little bit of cultural background to, to Job uh, because it, it's really important. So we said before that uh, the book of Job is probably the second oldest written book in the Bible, second oldest chronologically. Uh, so there was no, it, it, there were no Israelites. Uh, there's no reference to covenants, to the law, to priests, to the temple. This is a super ancient book about an ancient culture. Uh, but there, there's something you need to know about this, because it goes on for today. Uh, <clears throat> there's this theory called the retribution principle, and it still exists today, and it existed then. And, and it said that this, that the righteous will prosper, and the wicked will suffer in proportion to their righteousness or their wickedness. Hmm. So that's what is behind his friends, who are always poking at him and saying, well, why don't you just give it up and say mm -hmm. what you did wrong? Mm -hmm. What's not written in there is like the comma, because we all know that like if you are sick or something bad happens to you, it's because you did something wrong. If you were prosperous or you were wealthy, it's because you did something right. Uh, so in that culture at the time, Every culture had that thought. They had the interesting thing. You know, atheism really didn't become a thing until modern culture. Uh, it was supposed that there was somebody that created the world. Every culture then, there were false gods, it was everything. They had the belief in a god who was more powerful than them, often who could bring bad upon you if you displeased him and good upon you if you did what he wanted to say. So within that whole culture of the beginning of Job, everybody thought this way. And it was a carryover into even these old school followers of Yahweh, that they thought this. Uh, so you think, well, that's, that's just really weird. But that's true today. There's a, there's a lot of people that think uh, if something bad happens to them, it, it's because... Uh, they've done something wrong. Uh, when in, and, and if something good happens to them, it's because they've done something right. But it, it's just not universally true. It's not a, a principle that is true. Oh, you can prove that it's, it's not true. Is that that would mean that the richest people would be the, the most the devout most followers, yeah. the most righteous mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. And that would mean that the poorest people mm -hmm. <clears throat> were the least righteous or the most wicked. And certainly we all know that that, that is not true. I, I have had the pleasure of knowing people who didn't have two dimes to rub together who, who in faith just crushed me on a, on a good day. Just faithful, awesome people. And we all know there's no correlation between being super wealthy and uh, being super righteous. And we have to throw in with that that like it's not a concept also because any righteousness that we have is not the righteousness of our own. It's the righteousness that is imputed to us through Jesus Christ. So, that's the concept behind these guys as they kind of fool with him about you just need to give it up and you just need to talk uh, and tell us what on earth it is that you did because surely this is how God worked. And it worked. that's how they believe God worked in every culture, pagan culture, everything. It was just the way that uh, people saw God and righteousness and wickedness in the world at that time. Pastor Clayton says. Yeah. So in Job, we are in chapter 28 uh, through the end of the book, uh, through chapter 42. And I really, I did not think I was going to enjoy Job as much as what I did. Uh, but I do. I did enjoy it a lot, a lot. Uh, Just to clarify, he does enjoy the Bible. I, I want to make Bible. sure we all know. I love, he but when you think of Job, everybody's Bible. like, oh, Punishment, Blah. hardest life ever, like all of that. It doesn't sound very fun. Uh, we've been reading it so much good stuff in the book of Job. So 
we know about Job and what uh, Pastor Emery told us about last week. And then going to this week, we are introduced to Elihu. And Elihu is basically there to put Job in his place <laughs> and say, this is what you thought. Now, I've listened to you respectfully. I've listened to you, and wisdom is supposed to come from those who are older, and I've listened, but now you listen, and I speak. And Elihu goes chapter after chapter. Even It's funny, you read the next chapter, and it says, then Elihu continued. <laughs> he wasn't done. He continued some more, and he continued some more. And then we get to chapter 38, and we see it says, then the Lord speaks. And I love these chapters. Uh, mm. A lot of this is Elihu and the Lord both saying, here's God's place and here's your place. Sure. Um, you've sure. spoke and you've spoken out of hand. Mm-hmm. Um, you've spoken in a way you shouldn't have. Um, you've spoken about your own righteousness rather than God's righteousness. Mm-hmm. And we get to see the Lord say, okay, I, I'm going to speak and you're going to answer me like a man. Mm-hmm. And he just goes on. He said, did you create this? Did you do this? Were you here for this? How does this work? How does this work? Who created the stars? Who created the heavens? It goes on and on and on. And while he is doing that, putting Job in his place, we get to a picture of man, creation all over again, of how great God is. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily why God is doing it. He's doing it to put Job in his place and show his greatness. Um, but I love reading through this you can read pretty much any part through 38 through uh, 40 or 42 and just uh, can you fasten the chains of Pleiades or loosen the belt uh, of Orion can you bring out the constellations in their seasons or lead the bear and their cubs just over and over and over talking about the greatness and how incredible God is and how he is above all and how he is over all and finally he gets to this place where he allows Job to speak um, and we see Job is speaking very differently than what he was before. Um, Job comes to this place of confession. And fortunately for Job and for us, we see after that confession, God answers uh, with his grace and with his mercy to Job. And then even through Job's prayer for Job's friends, and we see restoration take place. Um, but it is a beautiful picture of God's greatness and knowing our place and then if we can continue on in the wisdom literature, we go, uh, we start into Ecclesiastes this week also. And this is why Pastor Mike was joking at the beginning, because as I read this, it is a lot of doom and gloom to begin with. Um, and that's not how the book ends, fortunately. But up to this point in wisdom literature, we've been reading a lot of Proverbs. And Proverbs has this idea of, if you do step one and step two, then there's the result. And we've talked about it to this point. That's not that's not exactly how Proverbs is meant to be read. Um, it is it is a very broad stroke of the brush, if you will. That in most situations, if you do this and this, this is the result. Um, where the author of Ecclesiastes goes in and says that's not always the case, though, and, and kind of focuses more on the when that's not what happens. And uh, when we look at this, over 40 times we see the teacher in Ecclesiastes talk about life being futile or meaningless. And if you look into that a little more, it's basically talking about how quick, how, how life is a vapor, how it is a breath. It is, it is here and then it is gone. And as you read Ecclesiastes, you need to know that there is two people here. There's the teacher and there's the author. The author introduces the teacher, and that's who we hear most of Ecclesiastes from, is the teacher. And he is almost, I don't want to, almost a little bit of like the critic um, in this, a uh, critical teacher. And then in the end, we hear from the author who does bring hope to the book of Ecclesiastes. A lot of Ecclesiastes, as we read, it is... Uh, Life is futile, life is futile, life is futile over and over and over. And a couple of things that as we read, you, you kind of get as main themes here. Again, life is short. Um, we are all in this march of time that's going on and going on. Uh, we are all going to come to a point where we die and that there's parts of life that we cannot control. Um, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, we can't control the outcome of it. 
And so that's what I meant when I came in this morning. I feel like I have to justify myself. When I came in this morning, I said, man, Ecclesiastes is doom and gloom. Uh, uh, give, give me a call and I'll give you the rest of that. Story. We're only going through the first six chapters this week, though. Uh, but as we get to the end of Ecclesiastes next week, we do see that there is hope and there is point and that, man, the author of Ecclesiastes had everything, absolutely everything. Uh, but the point is it wasn't about all that he could gain with his wealth. It wasn't about all he could gain with knowledge. It wasn't about all that he could explore. Um, but about, man, all of that, if not found in Christ, if we're not looking to God, then it does all seem, it, it is all meaningless without a relationship with God. Uh, but one of the ways I feel like it really does connect with Ecclesiastes, with Proverbs, with Job, all of it, uh, is knowing our place. And that's where I want us to end up at the end of, of wisdom literature today. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 2, he says, "Do not." he's talking about entering into the presence of God. He says, do not be hasty to speak and do not be impulsive to make speech before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. And so I love that we see that in Job. Man, Job needed to know his place. He was one of the greatest when it came to living in righteousness. He still needed to know his place. Here the teacher in Ecclesiastes had everything that money could buy, that knowledge and wisdom could get him. And still there's importance in knowing our place. And so no matter how little or how much we have, man, we have to know our place with God. No matter how much we know, no matter how much we don't know, no matter how much wealth or how much poverty we have to know, man, that God is the creator, God is above all, and we need to look to him in every area of life and realize that he is the creator. Um, he is above all and in each and every situation. We need to be looking to him rather than our own wisdom, our own knowledge, our own understanding. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah, that's good stuff, man. And the thing that amazes me is that God speaks to Satan, chapters 1 and 2, and then you have like 30-something chapters where it's just quiet. It's just him and his three buddies. Or got Job and his, yeah. his three buddies. And, you know, he certainly had to redirect his thinking. But several years ago, I was reading through Job, and it dawned on me, is this the way God brings comfort? By showing us his greatness and his majesty. And compared to what we're going through, his greatness is so much greater yeah. That he's got this, yeah. You know he's got this. You know your um, light affliction. I think mm -hmm. there's that phrase in the Bible. Is momentary. momentary light affliction, and you know he said this compared to what's coming. Yeah. You know this is a momentary light affliction. You lose ten children. Yeah. You know you lose your wealth. You lose your health. You got boys. Your wife says curse God and die. Yeah. You know, and she's a real winner. And, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, and his and his, you know, his friends know all that. He's a righteous man. Yeah. You know, he he's not, you know, he's not doubting God. He's just trying to figure out God. And a lot of the same things we go through, but when we have a completed scripture in front of us, then we still struggle with that. And so it's good stuff. Just. Um, Anytime, I would just encourage you, man, if you're going through something today, don't try to figure out what it is you're going through. I mean, you obviously got to be aware and you got to be smart and, uh, and and take due steps, but also refocus on the greatness, the grandeur, the majesty of God in heaven. Yep. And, uh, and Job has a lot of that. Yes, yes, he does. Good stuff. New Testament. So, New Testament, um, we're going through... 2 Corinthians 1, 12 through 6, 13. And 2 Corinthians differs from 1 Corinthians uh, in, some lot in that it's more of a personal um, letter from Paul versus 1 Corinthians was more of a practical letter that Paul wrote to the church. Here he starts to share just his heart and a little bit of the why and see some of the emotions with which he writes these things. And we need to hear this. Uh, life isn't all positive. Life isn't all good. Every message can be good, and 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 so so Paul is here sharing a very hard word in love, and I think that that is a place we need to learn to accept from Scripture and even from one another. Um, in in chapter two, um, 
uh, in chapter 1 of 2 Corinthians, he shows his heart. He says, I wrote to you and I was very troubled and unhappy in heart. I wrote with many tears. If you find somebody who's going to care enough to be broken for you spiritually, listen. 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 If, if there's young people listening and your parents are broken for you spiritually and they're trying to direct you, listen. If you have a friend who's praying for you, if you have a marriage that's struggling, if you're making an unwise decision and someone is broken for you, will you listen? Listen. And Paul here is writing to them with many tears. I don't write to make you sad, he, he, he writes here in 2 Corinthians, but to let you know how much I love you. This is the purpose of Paul's writings, is to share his love for them and to move them uh, toward Christ. And uh, he goes on in, in, verse, in chapter 2 to talk about um, the very lives that we live in Christ are to be lived out as an offering a sweet-smelling offering raised up to Christ. And um, to the Jews, this would, this would make so much sense because the Old Testament, a big part of the Old Testament sacrifices to Almighty God were when they would place incense and actually the aroma of the offerings that were raised up to God. And so Paul says here in 2 Corinthians, our lives as we share Christ are to be lived as an offering, as a sweet-smelling offering aroma to God. He says in verse 15 of chapter 2 specifically, um, he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. And so if you think of your life, this is our worship. This is in this, in this way, we can see that our worship is not just what we sing on Sunday morning, but how we live our, our very lives and our actions is, is worship. Uh, one of the songs that we used to sing in worship, uh, one of the earlier songs back in the day was, Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about the new way and the old way. The old way... Um, just showed us that we were guilty of sin through the law, but the new way actually made us right. It makes us right with God, and it's, it holds a much greater glory. And, uh, and then it goes on to say in uh, chapter 3, whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, because Moses, Moses was covered with a veil that covered the glory of God on his face, but our veil is taken to way as, away as we turn to the Lord, so all of us have had the veil removed. We can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. There is to be the glory of the Lord that is lived in our lives by our actions that are lived out as a Christ uh, sweet-smelling perfume raised up to the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. This whole process is, is to give God more glory as we are changed from who we are, who we were, to who Christ wants to make us. That brings glory. Glory to God. In um, I can only pick one of these last two to hit my time. <laughs> I'm going to hit this one. In uh, just 2 Corinthians 4. Starts off with never give up. Ends with never give up. Never give up. This, the retribution idea that Emery talked about at the beginning. Where if you do good, uh, if, you do, if you are righteous, then you're going to be blessed. Mm -hmm. If you aren't, then bad times are going to come. Paul kind of smashes this in the face yeah. in verses 8 through 12, and he, and he, he says this, uh, we're perplexed on every side, but we're not crushed. Or, uh, we're, we're pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're hunted down, but never abandoned by God. By God. We're knocked down, but we're not destroyed. And so I just want to say, he said, we live in constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. And so I think a question I just want to end with today is it, this is a little bit of a stretch day for us, maybe maybe spiritually and in, in our faith. Could I handle the persecution that Paul is talking about here? Can I? He, he says, we live in constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. I don't really think there are many of us, any of us, probably hardly listening to this podcast, that are living in constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, but he serves Jesus in that way. And so my stretch challenge to us is let's, let's never give up. 
live in that way, serve Jesus, and follow him as a sweet-smelling sacrifice raised up to God. Good stuff. Good stuff. Are we coming back to you for wisdom We're literature, good. or did you just give it all he right did. there? Gave it all right there. No, no more wisdom from you. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh out. Fresh out. <laughs> All done. All done. That's good stuff. You know, when you when you go when you look at the Bible, so many times when you read from the Old Testament, rarely is the time that you don't see somehow a connection to the new. Yeah. You know. So Job's going through these, you know, hard times, obviously. Children died, health gone, wealth gone, bad day. All of it one day. I mean, you talk about, you know post-traumatic stress syndrome and anxiety and everything that people would throw out there today. I mean, you know, and then we end with 2 Corinthians, you know, about don't give up, keep going, stand, you know, don't stop. And, uh, and so it's good stuff. Continuity of Scripture is absolutely amazing. Well, listen, we love you guys. Appreciate you. We'll see you Sunday. Be faithful. Keep reading the Scriptures. They're a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Continue to hide it in your heart so you wouldn't sin against God. Love you guys.